John 21. It says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of the disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you caught any fish? And they answered him, no. He said then, cast the net off to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, I remember he'll always let you know, uh, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, but only about 100 yards off. And this is an important verse. It says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire, I want you to underline that, in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard, hauled the, the net ashore, and uh, full, full of fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none, of you dare, now, none of them dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can grab a seat. Is there ever a, a moment in your life that you look back on and you wish you could go and undo it? Like, like something in your life that you wish, if you had the chance to rewind the tape, you would go and erase it from your past. I have uh, one I want to share with you. Um, when I was in high school, I had the, uh, the, a art project my teacher gave us, and a couple of my buddies were in this class with me, and I had this art project uh, to design an album cover. I have no idea why I'm telling you guys this, but well, I guess I'm going to do it. And... Um, we, uh, me and my buddy, so you could pick your genre and then you design the, the album cover. And so uh, we decided that we would go with a hip hop uh, group, right? So we, we, we designed an album cover, we chose hip hop, and then we came up with a rap group, okay? Now, at first it was just gonna be a picture, you know? And uh, that's just all it was gonna do. So we, we came up with a couple names, we needed stage names, right? And so we're on our way to uh, the field house to, for baseball practice after school, and he was an upper class, but I would ride with him, he was one of my good friends. And, and hanging from his rearview mirror was a Yankee candle scent called clean cotton. And so he's like, bro, that's me, I'll be clean cotton. And uh, I was like, dang, that's so cool. And, uh, and instantly, I'm like, what am I gonna do? So I'm sitting there racking my brain, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And, and, uh, and then finally, it hit me. I'll be like, I'll be the alter ego of you, like kind of like the dark side of you. You know, you're clean cotton, I'll be dirty silk. Sounds good, right? And so, and so uh, a brotherhood was formed, right? Clean cotton and dirty silk. And uh, we, we, uh, we, we created this album cover. We kind of had this like silhouette back to back, like, Clean Cotton, Dirty Silk, and because of the title of our names, we, we, we called that album Laundry Time, all right? And, uh, and so we, it, hey, we, we wrote a second one called Still Dirty, Still Clean, okay? So anyway, and, and anyway, so we, uh, we, we, we submitted it. It was so funny. People were laughing about it. They heard about it. Our teachers thought it was hilarious, and so we decided to kind of push, you know, push it forward a little bit, and uh, what we did was we went on to write a couple songs, and we said, hey, we're, this upcoming talent show, we're not going to tell anybody, but we're going we're gonna to enter it and close it out, right? So we had went and got all these white towels and put them on the backs of all the seats when, when they walked in. People didn't know what they were for. And then at the end, man, we got up there. We started performing this song and everybody swinging the towels. It was amazing, right? Like, and uh, anyway, so we, we went on to burn these, you know, burn these CDs, make a little extra lunch money. And it was just like this crazy thing that we, we did. Now, I look back at that and I was make sure you understand. Some of y'all right now see you. You're on your phones. You're trying to grab this on iTunes or something. Don't, don't do that. Don't, it ain't out there, okay? We've just sort of scrubbed the earth to, to get rid of this. But, uh, but man, we, I, mean, I, I look back on that, and, and, and I, we were such fools.
fools, man. I'm like, what we talked about, what we were, what we were doing, we were just trying to be funny. And I don't look back at those memories fondly. I want to make sure you understand. Like uh, I, today, even now, like I'll run into people from high school and they knew me back then, right? They knew BC Day Matt, right? Like before Christ. They knew that part of me. And, and I have to do all kind of explanations. Like, bro, look, like Jesus has saved me. Like that part of me is dead. It's, it was, you know, he was, it, it was laid on him on the cross. It was placed in a tomb. I used to be dirty, but praise God, I'm clean. Amen. Anybody? <laughs> and, uh, and so, man, they just have to, have to tell people this whole story now. And it's, you know, if I could go back, I would change so much. Like if I, if I could go back knowing what I know today, that the Lord was going to save me in college and, and cultivate a call to ministry in my heart and then send me back to my hometown to pastor, I would have probably done all kinds of things different. Now, some of you have this, this same kind of thing. Like you, there's truth be known in a room this size and regardless how big the room is, the reality is every one of us have some things, whether they be serious or not so serious, that if we could go back and rewind the tape and do it over, scrub from our history, we would do that. These are decisions that we've made that keep us up at night, regrets that we have, that we would rather live without, decisions that bring incredible moments, that bring incredible guilt into our lives. And some of us, and you walk in this room right now, and you're thinking about that thing right now. It's not a high school art project. It may be a high school relationship that went south. It may be, it may be something you've looked at. It's a place you've went. It's trust you've broken. And as you think back on that, some of you today maybe believe that that thing has disqualified you from usefulness with God. That it has sidelined you, benched you from being used by God. No matter how far you walk with Jesus, you can't get this thing out of the rearview mirror. Listen to me. There would have been nobody who would have felt this way more than Peter. No one would have felt this way more than Peter. He was part of the inner circle. He was the one who had the privilege, one of three who had the privilege to go up on the mountain and see Jesus transfigured. He was the one of the disciples who was known as the leader. He was out front. He was making decisions. He was often speaking without consent of the group, but just making decisions for the group. Peter was uh, the guy who told Jesus, I don't care who goes with you. I don't care who departs you. I don't care who leaves you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be there. Yet on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, as Jesus is being whipped and beaten and Isaiah says, marred, Peter's warming himself beside a fire, denying Jesus three times. You gotta imagine that as he thought back on those moments, the guilt he would have felt would have been crippling. The regret that he would have lived with would have been paralyzing. And the image that would have been locked in his mind of Christ literally carrying his cross, taking the cross while he willingly laid down his own, denying Jesus to a servant girl, would have been unbearable. No one would have, would have thought about going back and changing things and wishing that could be so more than Peter. He would have given anything to, do, to, to, to go back and undo these things. Now, here's what. We get the benefit, this side of redemptive history, of knowing that Peter would go on to be inspired by God to write two letters in your New Testament. We know this side of redemptive history that Peter would be the great like, early church father of the church, that God would use him in miraculous ways. But don't miss this. In this passage, at this time, Peter didn't know that. You know what Peter knew? My failure, my brokenness, where I blew it. What Peter would have been confronted with, captivated by, was his collapse. And he couldn't move past it. And this is where some of you are this morning. Like you've walked into this room, and if you're honest, you're like Peter in this passage you don't see a way forward from the thing that you did. You don't see a way past your past, and, and you don't think God can use you today. 
here's the good news. Because Jesus is alive, and listen, all these messages in the remainder of this series are built on the reality of an empty tomb and a resurrected Christ, and because Jesus is alive, listen to me, your failure doesn't have to be final. Right, Your collapse, that great moment of collapse and chaos in your life can give way to a comeback because here's the big idea. His grace is greater. His grace is greater than your sin this morning, church. His grace is greater. When we find the disciples in this story, they're in a boat. Jesus, at this point, he had, he had appeared to, a disciple, to his disciples in different times and in different ways, and this is now the third time that he's appeared to his disciples. Jesus is on the shore or the bank of the sea, and the disciples are again in the boat fishing with no luck. Now, if you remember, this was their occupation prior to coming to Jesus, prior to dropping their nets and following him and fishing for men. They were fishermen, and apparently they needed a career change because when we like see the, the disciples fishing, often their lines have slack in them, right? Their nets are often empty. And here you have, in the middle of all of these disciples, I want, to put, I want you to put yourself in the boat with them today. In the middle of all of these disciples out toiling all night, trying to catch some fish, you have Peter. And, and one of the things that stuck with me as you read this passage is that Peter is, he's the one that told the disciples, hey, I'm going fishing. Like, I'm going to go back to what I knew. I'm going to go back to what was comfortable. I'm going to go back to a place I can clear my mind. I believe that Peter didn't even care about what was in the net because of what was in his mind. He could not move past the reality of what he had done. He's locked into space. He's, he's captivated by this, this place. And I'm not so sure, again, that, that he wasn't he, was even, he even cared about what was going down, and in the middle of that, he hears a voice call out to him from the bank. A voice that what Jesus does as he calls out to him is not just what happens next, is not just the, the, the story of Peter's redemption. Look at me. This is the path of your own. You have regret in the room that you're gripped by. You have Doubts and, and guilt that you're overcome with. You want to know how you move forward when you've fallen so hard? You want to know how you get past your past? Well, what Jesus is going to show us is your pathway forward. And here's the first thing. You go back to the fire. You go back to the fire. Jesus calls out to the disciples, and he says this to him. He says, children, have you caught any fish? Now, here's what Jesus should have known. Okay, and he didn't know this, but go with me. Jesus should have known that if they had caught anything, they would have let him know, right? That's what fishermen do. Like, we're gonna tell you if we caught anything, and it's gonna be a little bit bigger than what we, you know, what, what's true, right? It, the fishermen are kind of like CrossFitters in a way. You know what I'm saying? They're gonna let you know. You gotta ask them. Right? You know, they're gonna have the gear on. They're gonna, uh, anyway, y'all didn't laugh. You'll laugh about that at lunch. Uh, that's okay. And uh, anyway, so he calls out. He says, have y'all caught anything? He's like, bro, we haven't caught anything. Our nets are empty. He's like, oh, great, great. Put off, put it, throw your nets off the right side of the boat. And, and immediately what happens is their nets were just overwhelmed with fish. They're just overwhelmed. They, they, they could barely get these fish into the boat. And then what happens is amazing. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he recognizes who it is. You see, he saw the power of God. He saw the provision. He, like deja vu, they had been here before. Earlier in the Gospels, this same thing went down, and he connected the dots. He said, oh, I know who this is. I see the power of God. I see the provision of God. And, and, and they, they were immediately just driven to the person, right? They knew this is Jesus. And so John declares, it is the Lord. And I love what happens. Peter just instantly throws on his outer garments, and he just jumps in the, in the sea, <laughs> The pastor says they're about a, a football field away from the bank, All right? Why didn't you just stay in the boat? Like, just, just row up, bro. Like, by the time he gets there, the, they, the boat's probably passing him. It beaches itself on the shore, and they start dragging the fish out of the boat. Peter gets there. He gets there to the fire, and, and I want to make sure we don't, we don't blow by something. You see, some of us can look at this, and we're like, why did he jump in? But here's the thing. It feels like an overreaction, but what I think it does is Peter's reaction shows us something about Peter's heart in this moment. 
See, when Peter saw who it was, he heard, it is the Lord, and he saw who it was, that this is Jesus, powerful and gracious. In the face of what he believed about himself in that moment, that he was broken and hurting, what naturally happened is he jumped in. He just jumps in. Because here's what I believe Peter understood, that who it was that was on the beach was better than what was in the boat. Who it was that was on the beach is better than what was in the boat. And I don't want you to blow by that. You see, some of us today, the reason we're not jumping into the grace of Christ, throwing ourselves at Jesus in sacrifice and love and and surrender is because we're not convinced that who is on the beach is better than what's in my boat. The reason some of you haven't jumped in financially just to, to radical generosity is because we believe that the comforts of the boat are better. The reason some of us haven't thrown ourselves at the mercy of Jesus is because we, we believe that the comforts of the boat are better. But, but here's what I believe is true. Before we will ever in our lives run to Christ with radical abandon. We have to come to the point where we also are convinced that Jesus is better. Peter jumps in and he didn't care who watched. He didn't take a lot of thought, apparently. He just throws his cloak on and just dives in. It feels spastic to me. But honestly, what it shows me is he's so overwhelmed with his own brokenness and he's so convinced with Jesus' faithfulness that he's like, I gotta get there. I gotta get, and I don't, I don't care who I leave in the boat. I don't care what I leave in the boat. I don't care who sees it, who agrees with it. I'm going in. Oh, listen, I wonder if some of you today are stuck in the boat because you're not convinced that Jesus is better than what's in the boat. But by the end of this message, maybe you will. Maybe right now that what Jesus is calling you to is to get out of the boat and to throw yourself at his grace. To not allow your past, your brokenness, your comforts, your kids, who cares, to keep you from what Jesus has to offer. Peter throws himself in, and by the time he arrives at the the shore, we see two words pop up in verse nine that I don't want us to miss on our way to lunch. Two words that are incredibly important for understanding what Jesus is doing in this passage. Verse nine says this to, to us. It says this. It says, when they got out on land, here it is, they saw a charcoal fire, I told you to underline that, in place with fish laid out on it and, it, and bread. See, only two times in Scripture are these words found. In this passage and in John 18, when, G- when uh, Peter is warming himself next to a charcoal fire as he's denying Jesus three times. So there's something significant happening here. You see, this, this fire, this, this charcoal fire prepared on the beach, the one that they found already stoked up, burning with fish and bread laid out. This isn't a background prop in the scene. This is, this is the scene. This is planned. This is purposeful. This is prepared because this is the point. Jesus wants to to take Peter back to that fire. He wanted to take him back to this place. You imagine when Peter got out on shore, the, the, the smoke coming off of that fire would have filled his, not only just his nose, sense would have been overwhelmed, but don't our sense typically take us to a place? Right, like, like on, on Monday, I got home, my wife had uh, some moon pies. <laughs> you know, she's always trying to be cute. You know, Monday was the, the eclipse that didn't happen, you know? Like, I guess it happened, but it was like super underwhelming. Um, anyway, so uh, not bitter or anything, but we, we uh, she's always trying to be cute. And so she ordered like sun chips and starburst and moon pies, you know, so anything that's celestial or some snacks or whatever. So, so our, um, I got home and there was moon pies on the counter and my wife said, hey, look, you want something to change your life? Throw that moon pie in the microwave and eat it with a spoon. 
Anybody? Can I get an amen? Testify? Okay. So I threw this moon pie in the microwave. That thing just, you know, lifted up, and I, I opened up the microwave, and this, what just billowed out of the microwave just transported me back to preschool. Like, like the last time I think I've ate a moon pie, I think was in preschool. I, I can, I, 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 like, I saw it all. Like I was back in that moment. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. There's a, maybe you have something that you, when you smell it, 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 it takes you back. It, for some of you, it may be a loved one that's passed on and you're, you walk into a room and someone wearing the perfume that they liked, you instantly are just flooded with all these memories Maybe it's a, a husband, a cologne that he wore, and you just remi- you're reminded. Maybe it's the smell of, of something that like your grandmother had in the house all the time, like a, a pie or some a dish that they made, and you smell it in your back, man, like you're there. This is all part of what Jesus is doing. He wants Peter to connect those dots. Why? Because he wants Peter to go back to the place of his greatest failure and to, and to face it. And you're like, Matt, that doesn't feel very loving of Jesus. Why does he want him to go back to that place he'd rather forget, that night he would rather move on from? Don't miss this. Confrontation, the way that Christ uh, confronts us and convicts us, that's not lacking grace. Confrontation that leads to conviction, which moves us to repentance, is grace. It is grace. And, and because we miss this, it, we, we mess up all kinds of, hard, we, we really sideline ourselves from all kinds of hard conversations that are really, uh, we need to lean into for the sake of godliness that we bypass or we sideline ourselves from because we think that it wouldn't be loving, it's not graceful. We've misunderstood grace. Grace doesn't, doesn't just uh, navigate around c- confrontation. Grace leans into it trusting that as we do, God will transform it. This is what Peter is experiencing in these moments. God wanted to take Peter back to that fire so that he could front it, he could confess it, and that the Lord could do a great work in it. Oh man, he may be wanting to do some of that with you today. There's a fire burning in your past. A moment a mess up that you want to move past and the Lord wants you to come back to it. He wants you to come back to it. Not to stuff it, not to hide it, not to to, to run away from it, but to go back to it. And again, not to dwell on it, but what Peter, what Jesus is wanting Peter to do is to be overwhelmed by the weight of our failure. Here's the reason why. So that we could be overwhelmed by the reality of his grace because his grace is greater. His grace is greater. So he wants us to come back to that place. Come back to that moment of failure. Come back to that disappointment. Come back to that fire. Because if you're overcome with regret, the point of this is that he doesn't want us to stay in the boat. If we're gonna move forward in faithfulness with God, if we're gonna move past our past, we have to go back to the fire. That leads me to the second point, which is this. He doesn't leave us there. He wants us to go back to the fire and he wants us to follow the Savior. It's that simple. Go back to the fire and follow the Savior. Now, I left this portion out of our reading up top intentionally because I want you to look at it with me right now. What happens next is Jesus, after breakfast, man, it's amazing, like, Christ just leaves him in it for a whole, like, meal. (laughs) He's just thinking about his failure. He's processing his his brokenness. This whole meal carries on, and then when breakfast had ended, it says that Jesus comes to Peter. I imagine he probably pulls him aside, and he asks him three questions. He says, Simon Peter, do you love me? (laughs) Peter's like, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then he tells him, he says, feed my lambs. And then he says again, he presses deeper. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know I love you. 
He says, tend my sheep. And finally, Jesus hit him with one more question. He says, Simon, do you love me? By this time, it clicks in Peter's mind. He knows now what Jesus is doing. God isn't asking Peter something so that he could clarify his adoration for him. He's doing this or learn something about Peter. This isn't for Jesus. This is for Peter. For Peter to clarify within himself his own adoration of Christ. You see, three times Peter had denied Christ by that same fire. And forever, this place, this fire would have been associated with his failure, with his brokenness. Every time he smelled fire, he would have thought, man, that's where I blew it. That's where I messed up. That's where I denied him. That's where I sidelined myself. That's where I couldn't be used anymore. That's, where, that, that's that huge hurdle. That's that elephant in the room. Like that place right there, I can't get past it. Every time he smelled fire, it would have been that. But here you got God, right here, Christ, telling Peter, taking him back to that fire and asking him three questions for three denials. He gives him three opportunities for confession. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You see, it was so gracious what Jesus is doing. He is showing us grace on display. Jesus is giving Peter an opportunity here to reaffirm his love for him and recommit his heart to him. Not to slap him on the wrist. And this is the heart of redemption, really, of reconciliation. You see, Christ's confession, his, his, his um, work of confrontation and conviction in our lives is not to slap us on the wrist or to sideline us. It's not punitive. It's always restorative. And he wants to take Peter back to this place and restore him. So he says, do you love me? Oh, what a piercing question for us this morning. Let me, let me ask you this question. If the Lord himself would come before you today and ask you that, do you love me? Matt, do you love me? What would you say? I think naturally our reflex is to say, well, let me tell you what I know about you. I mean, I know, I know of justification, I know sanctification, I know glorification, I know, I know all the facts. Like, let me give you my Bible trivia. And he'd say, yeah, 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 but that's not what I'm asking you, Matt. But look at my degrees. I'm a seminary. And <laughs> Do you love me? Some of us might say, well, look what I'm doing for you, Jesus. Like I, I'm serving and I'm giving and I'm reading and I'm leading and I'm doing all of these things for you, Jesus. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's not what I'm asking you. Do you love me? See, what Jesus is after is not what's in your head. It's what's in your heart. It's not your degrees. It's your devotion. That's what he wants. He doesn't need your resumes. He wants your relationship. He wants to know, do you love me? Do you love him? Do you love him this morning? And I think it's so interesting when you read this, what happens in the original language. Now, some people, many scholars, make the argument that John uses two words in Greek for love interchangeably. Some say, well, knowing the context of this exchange, there's something more to this. So I'll explain. When Jesus says to Peter, hey, Peter, do you love me? He says the Greek word agape. Do you agape me? Which is, do you unconditionally love me? And Peter replies in the original Greek, Lord, you know everything. You know I phileo you. A lesser word for love, a brotherly love, a friendship. Peter couldn't reply agape because of there was a condition. There was a fire. There was a charcoal fire in his past. He couldn't move on. And so it's almost like to every 
time, every question of Christ, do you love me? It's almost like you can feel the inner dialogue of Peter, like he's, he's recoiling from meeting Christ at the place of his expectation because there's this thing in the past he can't move on from. It's like he's saying, yes, Lord, I love you. I love you, but not like you deserve. Yes, Lord, I love you, but not like you're worthy of. You can just see this inner struggle going on in Peter's mind. You see, Peter could not get past the fire. And again, that's where some of you are right now. You, and this is, this is so true of Christian experience, by the way. The more we walk with Jesus, the more unbelievable his grace is. The more aware I am of my brokenness, the more I understand the holiness of God, the more I understand how that small thing put Christ on a cross and it cost his son great suffering and I can't move on from that thing. You see, some of you, you feel like you're pretty good off right now because you're looking horizontally at a room full of mess. Or you look at your family and you're like, wait, my, my brother is crazy, I'm good. <laughs> no need of grace here. Some of y'all look at social media, you look at the news, and you're like, man, this world is broken. I'm pretty moral. I feel pretty good. But when we start seeing God for who he is, holy, just, full of grace, full of mercy, set apart, the smallest stain in my past feels insurmountable. And Christ before Peter asking, do you love me? Peter couldn't meet him there. I've got this thing. I can't move past. But this is the gospel on display. What happens in this passage is balm for some of your souls right now. Because he wanted to take him here, but not leave him there. Look what he does. Notice his reply. He says, do you love me? All right, feed my, feed my lambs. Do you love me? Tend my sheep, tend the flock. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. It's like, here's what Jesus is doing. He doesn't relegate Peter because of his past. He takes him back to the fire. Jesus was fully aware. Right? His eyes met Peter's across the courtyard. He told Peter he would do this, by the way. And when it happened, he locked eyes with him to show him, I knew this would happen. But not, I don't believe, to look at Peter to say, I told you so. I think looking through Peter to this moment to say, I'll show you what I'm about to do. I'm going to take you back to your fire, to that place of your greatest weakness, that place of your greatest failure, and I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not going to relegate you. I'm going to reinstate you. I'm not going to give you a, a, an improvement plan. I'm going to give you a mission. I'm not going to sit you in the corner and make you uh, say whatever, you know, work to prove it to me. I'm going to give you, a, I'm, going to, I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to send you. That is the gospel, church. That's what Christ does to all of us. Every one of us in this room are a lot like Peter, more like Peter than we think we are. Every one of us in this room have a real past, real baggage with real regret and real shame. We may not have denied Christ with our lips three times around a fire, but listen to me, our lives tell a different story because that's what sin is. It's turning from God and every one of us, the scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So every one of us have denied Christ at some point with our own lives. And here's why this matters. Because we are real people with real sin that offends a real God and has a real price. But the gospel, the message that Christ wanted Peter to get is because of the cross. Because of the cross, that real price was paid by a real death and guaranteed with a real resurrection. With a real resurrection. You see, by the grace of God, Jesus has taken on the full weight of our sin, and he has paid the full and total price for it. And so the message for Peter, and look at me, the message for this room is that if you have placed faith in Jesus, it doesn't matter what's in your past. If you have placed faith in Christ and he's alive, then listen to me, your failure is not final. It's not. Your great collapse, that, that, that great collapse is not concrete. It, you're not stuck. 
right? It gives way to a comeback because his grace is greater. His grace is greater and it's offered to you this morning. It's offered to you. You don't have to go back. Peter didn't have to scrub himself clean, did he? No, you know what he had to do? Go back to the fire and follow the Savior. Go back to the fire and follow our Savior. You see, Jesus wants to take us back this morning to the moment of great weakness, to the words that we said, to the thing that we did, to the places that we went, to the trust that we broke. And he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to turn that fire of failure into the place of God's faithfulness forever. Let me tell you how this works out in my own life. I, uh, I have a charcoal fire story in my own testimony. When I told you all through high school into my freshman year of college, I didn't live for the Lord. My, my, my story, my, my past was just uh, rebellion, seeking after everything I could get any enjoyment from, even if it was just momentarily. When I was in college, it was about a party scene. It was about drunkenness and girls. That's what I gave my life to. That's what I gave my thoughts to. That's what I, I, I ran hard after. That's what I lived for was the weekend, was what we were getting into. And, and every morning, I, I would wake up with regret and with shame. Knowing, man, this, this can't be it. And the Lord began to do a work in my heart in those days. For, long, for, for a long period of time, I thought this was it. But then I think the Lord began to do a work in my heart and began to open my eyes that there's something more. And, and the holiness of God and my lifestyle were incongruent. They didn't mesh. And so I remember, man, this, this piece of curb, like a curb line, a parking stall out front of my apartment a place I would pull into to go into my apartment, to party, to, to give my life to whatever this world could, could offer. That same place I used to associate with great sin and great shame. One night on April 28th, I went down there on the phone with my old pastor, and I remember calling him and saying, man, I, I, I'm done. I don't know what to do. There was a party happening in my apartment as I was on the phone with him. And I said, man, I cannot do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm very capable of continuing to do this, but by God's grace, I want something more. I want something different. I want to go, I, 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 want, I want to follow Christ. I want to get out of this boat and I want to see what he has to offer on the shore. And so I, I sat down on that curb line and I confessed Christ as Lord. And he radically changed my desires. He radically, I had more of a the kind of, this isn't everybody's story, but I had one of the kind of the 180 moments in my life. And, and I tell you that story today because that place of shame forever, I don't remember it from that. Like I pull up to that place. I'm not gonna say, that's the place where I used to party. Right? That's the place where I used to go in and make bad decisions. I pull up to that parking spot. I say, no, that's the place where God saved me. That's the place of God's faithfulness. That's the place where I met the grace of God in my life. Oh man, listen to me. That's just not my story. That's not just for Peter. That's for you in the room today. Christ wants to call us out of the boat and back to the fire so that we might confront it, confess it, and then forget it as he replaces it with greater faithfulness. See, Peter didn't clean up his past. He just followed the Savior. He's followed the Savior from that moment. He had willingly at one point laid down his cross around a fire. And on that day, on that beach, I believe he picked it up and he never put it down again. In fact, church history would tell us he would carry it until he was nailed to it upside down. What Jesus told him, he didn't, he didn't relegate him, he didn't sideline him, he said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. He put him back in the game. He reinstated him. Here's what that looks like for us. Today, some of you are in the boat. You're in the boat, and it's because you cannot get past something in your background. You cannot get past this baggage you're carrying around with you. Again, some of you, it's a relationship. Some of you, it's something that's broken trust in your marriage. Some of you, it's something you've done years and years and years ago, and you're walking with Jesus, but you're not running for Jesus. You're not throwing yourself at Christ because there's this thing holding you back. You don't have to live like that. 
promise of scripture is if we would come to Christ, we would confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive it and to cast it as far as the east is from the west. He wants to take our brokenness, to take our shame as great as it is. And don't miss this. Your sin was great. My sin was great. Peter's sin was great. But God's grace is greater. God's grace is greater. And so right now, the band's gonna come, and I wanna ask you to do something. Here, here's what I'm asking from you. Some of you today, like literally, you're in the boat. You're in a boat of comfort. You're in a boat of complacency. I think there is application of this text to those in the room who have never thrown themselves at the mercy of Christ in a, in a, a, a moment of surrender to meet him for the first time. I think that's where some of you are. Some of you watching online, that might be you right now. You're sitting on a couch, you maybe wherever you're watching us from. And maybe the Lord is calling you off the boat and onto the shore. If you're in this room and you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus, you do not have to stay in the boat. If you believe, maybe for the first time, the Holy Spirit's opened your eyes to see that he who is on the shore is better than he who is in the boat. And whatever is there with you, that lifestyle, background, there's comforts. All you have to do is throw yourself at him. You don't have to work your way towards him. You don't have to clean and scrub yourself up clean and, and, and improve yourself, readying yourself for the grace of Christ. It is available right now. And there is nothing in your past that, separate, that can separate you from the love of Christ. There is nothing and so if you want to come to know him today, look, I'll be out those back doors to the right in the next steps area. We have encouragers. There's a place that you can go. There's people that will pray with you. You can go out that place. We would love to see you jump out the boat for the first time and to fall into the grace of Christ in a saving way. But here's how I think this applies to most of us. This passage is about recommitment. This passage is about rekindling a fire in our hearts that used to keep us from his faithfulness, from walking faithfully, running with him. This passage is about the, the believer in the room who, man, is walking with Jesus, but, man, we keep falling. We fall in our, in, in, in our sins. We fall in our, in our faithlessness. And some of us, I think, we begin to believe, man, how can I move past it? Go to the fire. Confess it and then replace it with a greater love for Jesus and a reminder of his promise that he will never leave you or forsake you. That there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is nothing this side of heaven that can keep you from, the, from an eternity with him. Listen, if you are found in Christ, you will never not be found in Christ. And so here's, the, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Here in a moment, the band's gonna come and they're gonna begin to lead us in a time of worship. And as they do, I think there is something powerful in the expression of getting out of the boat and coming to throw ourselves at his feet. If you want to use your chair, you can get up. You can say, Lord, I'm not staying in this boat. There is something in my past. My, I, I'm a little afraid of maybe what my wife is going to find out or if my, my kid, what they're going to think or who in the room might see if I go down. For, you know, maybe the, all these thoughts the enemy is whispering to you. Saying, no, 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 stay in the boat. But listen to me. Peter would have never got to the fire if he didn't get out of the boat. You want to know what it looks like to walk in greater faithfulness and the freedom that the cross has purchased for us? Come to the fire. You want to grab your spouse and say, look, this is this thing. We, we, we both struggled here. And confess it to the Lord. Confront it and say, Lord, by your power and your power alone, we want to run hard for you. You want to grab, maybe it's a friend, something in your past in school, a bad decision, a bad weekend decision that you made or whatever that looks like. You want to grab your parents, say, Mom, Dad, this is what I've done. You know, I want to come and pray together here. This would be a beautiful posture to say, man, what would it look like if this church said, there's nothing in the boat that's going to keep me from Christ? There is nothing in the boat. There's nothing in comfort. There's nothing in my past. There's no baggage. There's no fire that's going to keep me from the shore, from running with Jesus. What would it look like, church? And so in this moment, I want to ask you to pray. You can come. You can go out the back doors. There'll be people there for you. You do business with the Lord. And just remember, as great as your sin is, his, his grace is greater. Amen. Well, Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you so much 
for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. Oh God, I, I, I thank you that your, your scripture, God, it meets us where we are. When a pastor says that it is alive, active, it is so active in our lives. And so many of us, we've walked in here, truth be known, God, things in our past, things in our lives that have kept us from really believing, Lord, that you want to use us in a, in a significant way. Lord, Peter believed that at one point he would go on to preach the gospel at Pentecost to see thousands saved. He would go on to be one of the great church fathers that opens the gates, the kingdom of heaven to the Gentiles, God. He, he, if he would have stayed in the boat, God, but Lord, you called him out. And so God, there are some of us here that can't move past our past because we've believed a lie, Lord. But Lord, if we would come back to that place of failure, come back to that weakness, acknowledge it, confront it, confess it, and then replace it with the promise you are greater, your grace is sufficient. Oh God, you might lift some heads in this room. Some shoulders that are weighed down in guilt and regret. God might walk a little taller, a little freer. Lord, would you unleash this church? People that are bought by the blood of Christ and fueled by the grace of our Lord. Would you send us out, God? Would you use us in a great way? Father, I pray that you would move in this place, whatever there is that you're leading people to do business with. God, don't let us stay here. Don't let us stay in our seat, God. Move us. In the way that you want, Father, I pray you would do a great work in this place. We desire to see breakthrough, Father. We desire to see redemption happen. Oh, Lord, would you save in this place? We trust you, Father, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.